Snakes have long been a symbol of fear and danger in human society. While reptile enthusiasts tend to adore the animals, for most people snakes still carry an ancient terror. There's something about the idea of being bitten faster than you can move that unnerves you, I guess. Or being crushed alive by a serpent twice your weight, and then swallowed whole. Ophiophobes might have a hard time when visiting the reptile house at Zeus today, but it would be so much worse if they time-traveled to Eocene, India, where the monster snake Vasuki Indicus resided. Vasuki is one of the biggest snakes in Earth's history, and fits well into this Paleo Rewind episode's focus on giant prehistoric animals. April 2024 had a disproportionate amount described, and I'm thrilled to be talking about them. Vasuki Indicus was named after the Hindu god Vasuki, a divine snake worn as a collar by Shiva, the god of destruction. Vasuki's cultural impact has also bled into traditions in China and Japan, where Vasuki is known as one of the great dragon kings. Estimated at a length of 10 to 15 meters long, the animal certainly lived up to the name. It was a matsoid, which is an extinct family of snakes that thrived during the Cretaceous up until the Pleistocene, and it was also the dominant predator in Eocene India. Its remains, which consist of 27 giant vertebrae, were found in a coal mine in the Gujarat state of India. Dr. Dada, one of the authors who described the creature, stated that considering its large size, Vasuki was a slow-moving ambush predator that would subdue its prey through constriction like anacondas and pythons. This snake lived in a marshy swamp near the coast at a time when global temperatures were higher than today. It would have fed on small and medium-sized prey in its marshy environment, which it shared with crocodilians, turtles, and two species of early whale. Cuchicetus and Androsiphius. Given Vasuki's enormous size, it may have slipped in and out of the water to hunt various prey items, and would have used constriction to crush unfortunate animals that fell victim to its ambush tactics. Watching a snake squeeze a whale to death and then swallow it whole would be an awe-inspiring, if terrifying, sight. Speaking of whales, April also featured the description and naming of an animal that rivaled many modern whales in body mass, Ichthyotitan severnensis, one of the most massive ichthyosaurs ever discovered. This animal is near and dear to my heart, since I started following and making videos about it on the channel back when the first specimen was published in 2018. Since then, multiple new specimens have been discovered and described, and I've spoken with Paul de la Salle extensively about Ichthyotitan to provide some information you won't find on any other channels. Paul first found the remains known as the Little Stock Monster, the first Ichthyotitan serangular known, when combing the Westbury Mudstone Formation in 2016. The serangular, part of the rear jawbone, was positively enormous when compared to other ichthyosaurs, and led Paul and other authors, including Dean Lomax, Judy Massari, and Ramu Galois, to arrive at a rough length estimate of the complete animal at 20 to 25 meters. However, it was a fragment of one bone, which they did not feel was enough material to justify a new scientific name. Finding this material, however, did allow them to reinterpret bones found in the Oust Cliffs, another section of the Westbury Munstone Formation. Known as the Oust Colossus, this enormous shaft was so large it was believed for decades to represent a dinosaur's femur. In the light of the Lil Stock monster's discovery, however, Lomax's team realized that the Oust material actually belonged to another ichthyosaur serangular, one far larger than even the Lil Stock specimen. Fast forward to 2020. Citizen Justin Reynolds and his daughter Ruby discover another, more complete, giant serangular in Blue Anchor, further west than Lilstock, but still within the Westbury Mudstone Formation. This serangular was complete enough that together with the Lilstock material, Lomax's team felt comfortable naming a new genus, Ichthyotitan severnensis. A lot of work went on behind the scenes in the four years between discovery and formal publication, of course. It involved extensive histological analyses on the Lilstock, Blue Anchor, and Oust material, confirming their ichthyosaurian identity, as well as discovering that none of the titanic animals were completely grown. Ichthyosaurian histology is poorly understood, so what that means exactly is up in the air, but however big we think they were, they were probably bigger. I did an in-depth size calculation for the various ichthyotitan specimens in my video about blue whales maybe not being the biggest animals ever, but to sum it up, the largest ichthyotitan we have, which would likely include Oust, according to Paul, would be well over 150 metric tons and an excess of 30 meters long. Projecting a maximum size is fruitless and won't really get you anywhere, but it's bigger than that. Their enormous size is far from the only interesting aspect of their biology. An in-depth histological analysis led by Marceo Perillo and Martin Sander found that Ichthyotitan's bone structure was enormously strong, comparable to carbon fiber. They informally hypothesized that such strength could have been employed for rapidly opening the animal's giant jaws in a hunt, or was reinforced to use as a devastating ram. There are four specimens that confidently belong to Ichthyotitan. The Lilstock monster, which was the first found, 
the blue anchor serangular, which is more complete and forms the holotype for the genus. Then there's Olse, a fragment which was discovered by Barbara Billet and is about 15% larger than Lil Stock or Blue Anchor. Finally, Simon Carpenter found another anterior serangular in the Oust Cliffs that was only two-thirds the size of the holotype and had the diagnostic features of Ichthyotitan. So while Oust, by far the largest, is not officially referred to Ichthyotitan, it appears very likely to belong to the same species. We don't understand its ecological role, other than it would have been an extraordinarily large predator. Let's hope that more material, perhaps a complete skull with teeth, is found soon. And ichthyosaurs are strange not just in their extreme size and durable bone structure at those sizes, but in how quickly they became marine kaiju from an evolutionary perspective. Another April 2024 study involving Martin Sander found evidence for a 7.5 to 9.5 meter cymbospondylus specimen from Svalbard, specifically from rocks dating back to the very early Triassic, only 2 million years after the Permian extinction, or the Great Dying. Given how over 90% of marine life was wiped out during the Great Dying, it's extraordinary how quickly ichthyosaurs grew to near orca sizes and established themselves as the apex predators. That rapid timeline implies a Permian origin for the group, rather than a Triassic one as had long been thought. This would mean that ichthyosaurs not only evolved during the Permian, but were one of the very few marine vertebrates to survive the worst mass extinction in Earth's history. Continuing on the theme of body size and prehistory, you may have heard of Bergman's Rule. This is the idea that as you grow closer to the poles, homeothermic animal body size increases as an adaptation to the cold. The more volume to surface ratio an organism has, the better it can retain heat. For years, we weren't sure if that rule even applied to dinosaurs. But in April 2024, a team led by Lauren N. Wilson ran a statistical analysis of dinosaur body size compared to latitude, including the animals of the Prince Creek Formation in Arctic Alaska. They found that not only did the rule seem to not apply to Mesozoic dinosaurs whatsoever, but it also had no bearing on mammalia forms, which were the ancestors of modern mammals. Heck, even modern birds and mammals using a sample size of thousands of species didn't even have a correlation. Extant birds in isolation only showed a very weak trend of increasing body size in more extreme latitudes. Essentially, Bergman's rule isn't much of a rule. It's a cool idea, but one that isn't backed up by recent analysis. As a matter of fact, some of the biggest dinosaurs lived in middling latitudes, like the Argentinian titanosaurs, including Argentinosaurus itself. 2024 gave us a new titanosaur from the region with the evocative name Titanomachia Jimenezi, named after the Titanomachy of Greek mythology. At around 6 to 10 tons, Titanomachia is the size of a large African elephant, although nowhere near the biggest sauropods. Described from a vert and some limb material, it was apparently a saltosaurine, so it may have possessed some osteoderm armor. It's hard to get much cooler than armored sauropods in my opinion. But what about a smart sauropod? Well, that might not be very realistic, according to the latest study in the debate on dinosaur intelligence. A team led by Kai R. Kaspar analyzed dinosaur brain cavity shape compared to crocodiles and birds and concluded that they generally resemble crocodiles more closely, debunking a 2023 study that indicated avian or even primate level intelligence for multiple dinosaur groups. Relatively large brains were only noted among Manoraptor forms the theropod group that included birds and dromaeosaurs, and it was found to be unlikely that non-avian dinosaurs would have avian-like neuron density values. Tragic, I know. But not all is lost. Only being as intelligent as a crocodile isn't that bad of a place to be. Crocodiles have been observed to engage in cooperative hunting with one another, and even form bonds with humans on very rare occasions, like with Cheeto and his croc buddies Pocho and Pocho 2. What that might mean for a theropod group behavior is anybody's guess. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Paleo Rewind. Make sure to check out the other episodes, and thanks to Edge for organizing this event every year. It's fun to be a part of the community and help everyone stay updated on the amazing changes always happening in paleontology. I'm the Vivid N, and I'll see you next time.